Good day everybody. So here we are to discuss another important and very interesting concept that is modernization and issues of modernization in developing countries. In this lecture we are going to discuss the various features of modernization, causes of modernization, the various components of modernization, the idea as to what modernization is all about, the effects which it has on the economies, we'll discuss some of the negative impacts, the whole journey of modernization and what modernization to what goals does the modernization lead the people of a country, especially in the developing countries. We'll be talking about countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America. The three continents which have countries which need modernization, which are already in the process, on the process of modernization, where the journey has, is a mixed bag, bag with mixed results, but still we are moving towards modernization, uh, modernization, modernizing our economy, imbibing new things, absorbing new things, um, molding them according to our situation. Now, what is modernization? It is a multifaceted faceted concept, a very dynamic one, a concept which is comprehensive and which talks about change. Now, there are people who say, critics who say that modernization is a negative phenomena and there are others who say that it is a, it might be a negative phenomena, but it is, it is a process from which we cannot turn ourselves we cannot turn our back towards it. We have to um, uh, go towards uh, the future with the process of modernization. So it, uh, modernization is a process which talks about a flow of ideas. It talks about uh, influx of new ideas, uh, new thought, new way of living. It talks uh, about, uh, uh, it is usually desirable, uh, sometimes it might be forced or foisted on you and then you realize the results later on that yes, modernization was the need of the hour. Uh, it is a concept which is very dynamic uh, because it talks about evolving, it talks about moving ahead. Uh, yes, in some places uh, that moving ahead has come at a cost, we, we'll discuss about it later, but more or less modernization means imbibing the new and in this chapter, in this lecture, we are going to discuss that what are the obstacles in the process of modernization and um, how we are facing them or how we are removing them and how we are molding them to move into a better future. Modernization is a very complex process. Uh, it, it occurs usually when it is, uh, it is uh, accepted. Uh, in other cases, when it is not desired from the people, but might be healthy for them, it can be forced upon them. Uh, so uh, modernization uh, uh, takes on new forms with every situation, every generation in every country. So it's, it, it is very complex in which uh, there is a lot of give and take from both the sides and the population has to uh, go with the flow of ideas and accept the new. Now uh, modernization uh, started from uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, where the industrial Revo revolution uh, came in, industries were set up in a great speed. It led to a change in the social fabric, social, economic and political uh, fabric of United Kingdom, where there was mass migration of people uh, who were dependent on agriculture in the ruler sector, uh, who migrated to the, uh, to the cities, to the towns in search of work, which was readily available as they were told uh, in the industries which are set up in the uh, various towns and cities like Leeds, Manchester and so on. Uh, and then the idea spread to the whole world where uh, modernization was adapted by every country according to its own uh, definition, according to its own parameters. Modernization embodies hope. It's usually a hope for a better future, for a better standing or standard of living. 
Now coming to United Kingdom, which I just told you talked about industrial uh, was the first country to have industrial revolution. Uh, the industrial revolution was uh, was heralded in in the country uh, because of uh, new inventions, a lot of innovation, saving, and an urge to grow as a, as an economy and as a country. United Kingdom, as you know. Uh, commanded the seven seas uh, they had a uh, you know a navy uh, with which was enviable they had because it's an island nation um, they had to expand uh, to survive so the only way till the air force did not come in was commanding um, the seas ruling the seas making colonies getting back raw material for the industries uh, taking the manufactured goods back into the colonies and to the various markets in europe asia so on and so forth so the united kingdom uh, had an abundant labor force about which i just talked uh, because um, you know, agriculture was in dire strait there was abundant workforce workforce employed in agriculture which we know is um, disguised employment where um, uh, five people would be working uh, on an acre on a hectare uh, which needs only three so the two who were uh, just absorbed in agriculture but re really not producing anything walked up to the cities and towns to find work so there was an abundant labor force uh, of course because of that ab abundant labor force a lot of exploitation also happened uh, which led to the rich becoming the richer and the rich exploiting the poor because if they asked for 10 laborers there were 100 standing in the queue which led to uh, paying them less wages uh, hoarding of wealth by the rich and so on and so forth so united kingdom uh, was the one which uh, uh, takes the credit for the modernization process now uh, modernization does not really mean modernity it means imbibing the values and moving and moving from one stage to the other in such a way that you that you keep with you whatever good is there in your civilization in your traditions in your culture and molding them a little with something which we can absorb from the other cultures right now uh, in india the pro modernization in developing countries takes up altogether new connotations uh, the developing countries are in a quandary they are in a confusion with the process of modernization whether to modernize or not if yes at what speed how much what to take what to make obsolete of their own um, civilization if the other answer is no to modernization then why not or can we survive without modernization so in the developing countries this question and answer session of modernization carries on along with the process of modernization now there are critics who say that india for example has not followed the gandhian concept of development at all yes in the directive principles of state policy we do give a budget uh, for the village and small scale industries but then the big industries rule the world mass production rules the world mahatma gandhi talked about decentralization we have implemented decentralization by the 73rd and 74th amendment by giving power to the uh, village panchayats and to municipal corporations and municipal committees uh, a very recent achievement uh, the 73rd and 74th amendments are very recent achievements and much needs to be done to implement them in a proper way yes elections to the panchayat and the panchayats and the municipal corporation is held but not at the way they are held now because a lot of money and muscle power is used in the elections so mahatma gandhi uh, mahatma gandhi's idea of modernization uh, has been as critics say left somewhere uh, on the way but uh, india has uh, decided to modernize itself and move ahead 
by by passing very progressive laws uh, but along with it especially with the present um, government uh, which talks about hindutva we are trying to balance between our ancient tradition culture and the process of modernization marx the famous philosopher the german philosopher said industrialization is a necessary evil he said when you have industries workers come there for employment they talk with each other they share their stories of exploitation their grievances and they are they bind together and they fight for their rights no wonder he said workers of the world unite you have nothing but your chains to lose so he said industrialization will only accelerate the process of revolution in which the proletariat will rise up against the bourgeois and crush them finish them off and there'll be a classless and stateless society he said that in countries like india china all the developing countries this process will only uh, usher in a new era of goodwill and uh, of the workers being liberated that is why he talked about banning religion uh, and he said religion is the opium of the masses now a stage by stage by stage um uh, steps given by david apter uh, are very very important who talks about modernization in a few stages he says stage 1 in the stage 1 what will happen the colonial powers like the british who ventured into making colonies in india in asia uh, and the portuguese portuguese who went into africa to get uh, to harness colonies in the first stage these colonial powers uh, go into colonies or into new lands uh, for maybe for adventure uh, but mostly for trade for profit and number 3 to have a missionary zeal that is to convert people uh, of the uncivilized um, uh, world into a civilized world that is uh, of the western world uh, so as you all know the theory of um, the white man's burden uh, the color of our skin uh, that is brown and black as in africa in uh, asia uh, makes us uh, inferior to the white man who boasts of a white skin and that is why he is superior now the theory is uh, that uh, uh, that we the people of the um, of africa asia are uns- uncivilized and they need to be taught how to live in a civilization and who is going to teach us that it is the white man who is going to teach us that how to uh, eat how to dress up how to be educated um uh, everything about hygiene uh, everything will be taught to us by the white man um never mind uh, that they brush off uh, our argument that for example the hindu civilization is a very old civilization uh, we might not eat and dress dress up like them but the hindu civilization boasts of um, boasts of um, astronomers we boast of scientists um we boast of the best of literature in the in the form of vedas upanishads and all that which we which we uh, had when the westerners came to india uh, so brushing aside all our achievements just because the color of the skin was different and we did not um, eat and live like them we sat on the floor uh, and had our food uh, the indians wore wore dhotis because that suited our climate we were because we did not wear trousers uh, tight fitting clothes or take the example of vietnamese who kept long hair uh, we were supposed to be uncivilized so the white man thought that in the first stage i i have come here for adventure or i have come here for profit zeal uh, for profit or for trade so along with it i have to do the missionary zeal that is to convert these people uncivilized people into my way of living my way of eating and my way of dressing up and in doing all this and in converting the people into christianity into his religion 
if the colonial power takes a little bit of resources, which we call exploitation, if the colonial power takes a little bit of our natural resources, it's just a small payment for teaching us how to live in a civilization, brushing away the fact that India, a country like India had a very rich past where uh, gigantic steps had been taken in the, in the fields of literature, science and technology. So according to David Apter, stage one means uh, when the colonial power entered Asia, Africa, these countries, the British, the Portuguese and all these colonial powers and uh, they came in for profit but slowly they started hobnobbing with the natives as they called us with the natives and uh, in the initial stage they did not have any contact they did not want to come in contact uh, with the uh, with the natives because they found us inferior but slowly they started uh, uh, you know uh, hobnobbing with the local elite which had come which had come up because of the policies uh, followed by the colonial power in which among the natives, they helped create a local elite which, which helped them in administrating the country, which helped them uh, to increase their profits. In the process, the local elite got a little share of the profit which made them apart. So once they started, uh, they, they came in contact, the white man came in contact with the small elite and were introduced to the various, various cultures, uh, they decided to reform our societies, they decided to modernize our societies. In stage two, there was a close contact between the local elite and their foreign counterparts. They both worked together to reap profits. The effort of the colonial master was to spread health and educational facilities but the sense of superiority continued. It was always there. The negative effects were that the colonial masters struck at the root of our traditions and cultures. They tried to wipe away whatever good was there in our societies. Let me give you two examples. The Guru Shishya Parampara, which was, uh, which was something uh, the Indians prided themselves upon in which uh, a guru uh, set up a school either in the temple courtyard or in his own house or by the land donated uh, to him by the village people who wanted education for the for the children. Uh, there was no classroom, um, there was no fees, there were no textbooks, there was no attendance uh, and uh, the children uh, paid the guru uh, in kind. For example, a cobbler's son would gift a pair of shoes to the guru and the guru taught all of them together uh, and any child who had a great potential was given uh, special attention by the guru. So uh, all the uh, learning was oral, um, the children were taught orally and it was uh, and taught in the mother tongue which led them to be um, very very proud about their culture and heritage. They were taught skills also. No attendance meant uh, that uh, during the harvest season, every member of the family, including the children, used to help in the fields. So officially the school would be off for two months. So even the poorest of the poor uh, could send their children to school, uh, could uh, educate their children because the school would be off on a certain time. There was no attendance problem. So a very good way in which the le child learned skill also and was educated also. The Britishers came and with them uh, they brought classrooms, an end to creativity, textbooks, attendance problem, fee structure and so on and so forth. And when a guru did not adhere to their guidelines, the grant stopped coming. Slowly the gurus found it very difficult to run schools by themselves and the Guru Shishya Parampara just died down. Another good example is of the Tonkin Free School in Vietnam. Uh, they op the school, the name might be free, but it was not free. The school was opened by the French uh, and it was known as Tonkin Free School. It was run in the evening in which education was given in French and the Vietnamese were taught about science, technology, hygiene. And one condition to attend that school was to wear trousers, that is the western clothes, 
and the Vietnamese have a tradition of keeping long hair. The children were told to cut hair and then come to the classes. So slowly in these two cases what do we see? That in the second stage the colonial masters, it might be the French in Vietnam or the British in India, they struck, struck at the traditional culture customs of the country making us feel inferior, making the brown man, the native feel that it is better to leave his customs and ape the West. In stage three, uh, the demand for participation by the local elite uh, starts off as a feeble voice but becomes stronger. The colonial master is not ready for it. He's ready to appease the local elite. And in this, we can give the example of the formation of the Indian National Congress formed by A.O. Hume in India, uh, in which uh, the Britishers said that the local elite will be able to come and uh, work along with the uh, colonial master and we will uh, work for the benefit of the colony. The same Indian National Congress, when asked for more and more participation, it was called a microscopic minority by Lord Dufferin that it did not represent the Indian masses. So the third stage is when the local elite asks for uh, more powers, more participation in running the affairs of the state. Uh, it is not liked by the colonial master and um, uh, the local elite takes to the roads, takes to the streets and creates awareness among the people to come forward and help them uh, ask for more, uh, more um, participation in the political process. Stage four is a very dynamic stage, very interesting stage, a very challenging state, a stage in which the local elite and the common people come together and ask for freedom, complete freedom, which is a very harsh demand according to the uh, colonial master. Uh, they do not want to give freedom to the colony, saying uh, the colony will not be able to fend for itself, the excuses are many, but the voice becomes so strong that the uh, freedom has to be given to the people because the local people and the elite are one. Um, uh, the divide and policy uh, program policy for divide and rule policy which is followed by the colonial masters uh, is uh, weakened a little though it ultimately led to the partition of India but for some time people come together so you have the non-cooperation movement the civil disobedience movement in which the in India in India for example the Indians showed their strength of uh, showed their strength their unity solidarity and finally the uh, colonial master was uh, dri driven away. Now comes freedom, you know. Once you have freedom, then the process of modernization starts according to the wishes of the people of the country, the citizens of the country. So what happens once the country gets its freedom? The task of nation building starts. The task of modernization starts. The task of, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, competing with the other states, uh, not losing the essence of one's own culture starts. And this is where the process of modernization comes in. After freedom, after liberation, the local elite naturally become uh, the stakeholders. They are the ones who emerge as the new leaders. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm among the people there's euphoria, people are very happy with the change of government, um, the government is their own. Uh, the same set of leaders, uh, when they were not the prime minister or president of the country, had led them on the streets, had promised them the moon, had promised them uh, a, a, a fulfillment of all their basic needs, eradication of poverty, illiteracy, malnutrition, uh, all the problems. Uh, so uh, the uh, freedom is met with a sense of et enthusiasm, happiness and a lot of expectations which were promised to the people once the colonial master would be driven away. But slowly uh, magic does not happen. Uh, as we all know, 
a colony when it becomes a nation is infested with too many problems of course you have poverty illiteracy um uh, women in a bad shape um malnutrition high infant mortality rate name it there are all problems plus the colony has been badly exploited by the colonial master in case of india it was divided into two countries india and pakistan so you had problem of uh, uh, millions of people who had to migrate which is known as the biggest transfer of population in the world resettlement of refugees uh, women suffering again in this in this process because they say as they say men make war women and children suffer so resettlement of refugees um, uh, the problems are many so the initial euphoria leads to dis- turns into disappointment uh, the people start ruining the fact that the colonial masters were doing a better job uh, they start feeling bad that there was a transfer of par in the first sense they uh, so uh, the leaders have a very very challenging um, uh, challenging task in hand uh, to appease the people while uh, doing the while uh, on the path of na- nation building uh, the bureaucracy uh, which was created during the colonial masters time emerges as a very big factor um, uh, they are there to make policies but they are also there to mar the development process in many ways for example uh, india for a long time uh, till 1990 91 was known as the license raj why because the bureaucrats had to be uh, taken into confidence before making any policy so um, the bureaucrats continue to hold power rather uh, a freedom gives them um, uh, with the with the lack of uh, politicians uh who are experts the bureaucrats uh, get a larger than life image uh, they there is a phenomenal increase in their power and prestige and they do not want to uh, let go of the colonial uh, signs and they want to stick it stick to it because uh, the uh, all those uh, uh, powers given to them by the colonial power uh, master only added to their uh, becoming more and more powerful in the later stages there's emergence of vote bank uh, leaders hold hold wealth uh, there's concentration of wealth by a few progressive laws are made but there's a gap between theory and practice um, in the case of india uh, the vote bank is there but along with that you have the dynasty rule where the whole country is being uh, uh, is being run by a few families so dynasty rule is one of the biggest curses of the indian political system besides that you have a vote bank on the basis of caste uh, region um, then uh, there is a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few uh, so these are the problems in uh, in india when it comes to modernization and which does not let the process of modernization move at a uniform speed the government in india is racing against time to implement the idea of a welfare state but still women scheduled caste scheduled tribes uh, uh, are left behind there are many people who are still on the margins of the society they have to be included in the development process a very tough task uh, but the tribals for example uh, refuse uh, refuse to be included in the modernization process uh, they derive their uh, livelihood from uh, from the forest uh, which is the resource of all the minerals and natural resources it is the source of their livelihood now uh, the, the mafia of politicians and businessmen uh, wants to take up the control of forests and uh, tribals have been displaced in many places in some places the tribals are uh, uh, protesting against it because they want due compensation or they do not want to move away from the land of their ancestors but the mafia uh, of uh, the nexus between the politician and the businessman is another curse of the indian society but the people at the margins for example the tribals have to be included uh, so that the idea of a welfare state and modernization is attained now we come to africa 
Africa, another continent, a fragmented continent, a fragmented society where people are divided on not only uh, on the basis of uh, elites and the natives, but on the basis of tribes also. Uh, slavery has uh, is one uh, cause which has uh, is one factor which has troubled the African continent. Uh, people have been bought and sold like cattle. Uh, for uh, they were transferred to uh, plantations in America and other continents to work as slaves uh, in the other countries. Um, again, the local elite, benef elite benefited a lot from the slave trade in connivance with the foreign players. So Africa has a, a different set of problems which is stopping it. Uh, which is proving to be obstacle in the way of the development process. In Africa, the tribal people's rich land is being snatched from them. Uh, they are being displaced from their, from their land. Um, the practice of apartheid, discrimination on the basis of color, uh, has, has made the sense of inferiority very, very strong among the uh, Africans. Uh, political instability is there, which has led to a lot of totalitarian regimes being set up and democracy taking a toss uh, and being thrown out of the country. So in regimes, the process of development and modernization uh, is slowed down or rather it comes to a halt. In Latin America again, uh, there are a lot of totalitarian regimes. The local elite uh, lets in progress, lets in new winds of change at its own whims and fancies. Uh, and there is poverty among people, illiteracy among people, lot of deaths of women and children because of lack of hospitals and good medical aid. Education does not even meet the basic parameters in many of the countries, which has led to a lot of emergence of many gang f uh, gangs in uh, in the continent uh, there is uh, latin america is one country which reports of many street fights uh, which is a result of all the dissatisfaction uh, um, disillusionment uh, among the people now uh, how do we summarize this uh, the path of modernization is strewn with obstacles um, there are uh, there are obstacles but they have to be crossed over the local elite has to play a very, very responsible role. Uh, they will not part away with their wealth, which they have accumulated over centuries, but they have to, they should learn how to share a little bit of it in such a way that the whole country progresses. Uh, the local elite and the leaders have to play a very, very positive, constructive role uh, to uh, make the idea of modernization a success and a reality uh, in the developing countries. Thank you.